when they said that we were going to go surfing, I thought, fantastic, Bondi Beach or California, miles of sun-drenched sand, gorgeous men everywhere in wetsuits. And where do I come? The East Coast, the North Sea. And that just looks cold. I don't think pink's really my colour. As for this beauty, what do you reckon? The surfy lifestyle, cool clothes for sunny days. The days of Dukes of Hazard have been reborn. Daisy Duke. This is big business that's worth millions in the UK alone. It doesn't matter how far you are from the coast. If you want the image, you can buy it and live the dream. All I need now is some sea. It's a bit chilly, but confidence is high. Got my accessories? Show me the water. The weather conditions are really good, and the surf is perfect for a beginner. And this man has put money on the fact that he can get me to stand up first lesson today. My entire year's salary. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you, millions wouldn't. Before we get in the water, though, a quick lesson in surfy terminology. Sex wax. Not to be applied on the naked skin. Wipe out. When you fall off. <laughs> Over this one. Okay. Five years since the jockey club allowed ladies to take on the lads, but the racing game is still one dominated by men. This battle of the sexes supposedly takes place on a level playing field, but when it comes to picking a winner, is it really worth having a flutter on a female jockey? Come on, lucky lady! But while some women in the sport believe they're being saddled with the likes of these, I'm really sorry, fellas, there are others who disagree. Alex Greaves is Britain's most successful female jockey ever, riding more than 300 winners, and she remains the only woman to have ridden the derby. Now retired from riding, she remains involved in the industry as a trainer near Thirsk. Do you think there are more opportunities now for women in the, in the sport than there were in your day? It has. It's definitely progressed, especially the last sort of seven or eight years. Keeping reptiles as pets is a fast-growing hobby, and most, like this little fellow, are non-poisonous. And some require a lot more care, like this chap. He's a Burmese python, a constrictor, and he will put the squeeze on you. But there's an increasing number of people who want the ultimate in reptiles. People who want to buy and keep these. And if you think I'm picking him up, you're wrong, because he's deadly. Uh, uh. Terry's just started talking to someone now. He's got a, some sort of sports bag with him. Yeah. Money's changing hands now. 20. Oh, 40, 60. That's that, the deal's done. This man's just sold a deadly snake to a complete stranger. The trouble is that some people don't know what they're being sold, and they're just not being told by the more unscrupulous pet shops. Sheila Whitaker is on her second attempt at keeping a parrot. Her first bird was aggressive, noisy, beyond control. She bought it from a Leeds pet shop who hadn't said it was wild caught. I know you have to give parrots a lot of attention, I thought, am I giving it enough attention? Did you have any idea that you could still get wild birds in this country? No. No. And the people in the pet shop didn't offer any, any information or guidance there? No. No. Just want your money? I just got my money. We're now following him doggedly around the West Midlands, and we'll just have to see where he goes. And through the traffic jams, eventually we caught up with him. Hi, I'm Emma Milne from Inside Out on BBC. I wondered if you, we could ask you a few questions. Yeah, I'm to you. So you don't mind if we ask you? Yes, I do. Mr Walker, who has got a previous conviction for animal cruelty, initially seemed reluctant, but then changed his mind. Do you think it's all right to sell birds out of the back of a van, though? 
people and give the option. They don't need to buy the birds at the end of the day. Would you just mind telling us if you've got a pet shop licence? No, I haven't. No. Well, I suppose it remains to be seen whether he'll continue to trade in wild birds. But I just hope that anyone who's considering buying a parrot will think long and hard about where that bird's come from. Deep in darkest Darlington, something not so nasty is lurking in the woodshed. What we have here is an enigma, an oasis in a sea of horticultural struggle. On the outside, it's a shed, but on the inside, it's a pub. Have a good swig. Mmm, that's nice. You like that? I think that's my favourite one of the three. Yeah. <laughs> Covered it. Have you ever made a bad one? If I do, I tip them all on the lawn. Really? Really, yes. And you know what happens, don't you? The grass comes up half cut. <laughs> Thank goodness his beer is better than his jokes. When Dick Turpin was making his getaway, the only way the law could catch him was on horseback. And that was the start of the mounted police. Three centuries on, they're still keeping the peace. It's just a different kind of rebel. We're off to look after the clubbers of Beverly with Humberside's mounted police section, led by Sergeant Tony Burns. And have we got an unusual view for you? A special camera to give a horse's view of the nightlife. It's quite a quiet town usually, isn't it? During the day, it's hustle and bustle with shoppers and sightseers. Tony, things seem to have moved up a gear. We've seen some other policemen arriving. Yeah, it's now the time of night when uh, the, the people in the pub start to drift out. Do you think it's easier to talk to the police when they're on the horses rather than in the cars? It's intimidating when they're in yes, the cars. Yes, definitely, yeah. The police have been holding this group of fans here just until they can clear the way ahead so they can get safely to the train station without meeting any of the opposition. It's been a long day for everyone. And if I were a police horse, I know what I'd be thinking right now. Job well done. Two six! Hey. Two six! Hey. Two six! Ah, sailing into the sun, the romance of the waves. Hoist the spanker and welcome aboard the tall ship Lord Nelson. Not just any tall ship. It's one of only two in the world specially built to be crewed by people with disabilities. These are the bunks. This is what we call a mess. Maybe not in there. Have they finished yet? No, keep going. I think you've missed a bit down there. Here's the most important man on the ship. Hi, Jerry. Now, I'm never one to refuse a challenge. A hundred foot mast? I've got to beat the boys to the top. Are we nearly there yet? That is hairy. I've just climbed to the top of a hundred foot mast and I feel on top of the world. I want to find out just what it feels like to do this in a wheelchair. Just pick up the line, guys. She has no control over her destiny. It's all up to the people she's worked with the last two, two days to hoist her. So she's going to feel quite uh, nervous, I think, about this trip up the mast. It's more scary than when okay. I went up before. Right, OK, don't heave on it. You're just supporting it there for the moment. Hi, <laughs> open. Enjoy it. God, that is so scary. That's much scarier than the other way. <laughs> Absolutely fair play to everyone who's done it because being totally able-bodied and doing it is quite a feat, I think. And to see other people do it in that way is amazing. And just to have the opportunity, you can see how liberated it makes people feel.